2024 Green Party presidential candidate Dr. Jill Stein was arrested during her participation in a pro-Palestine protest at Washington University in St. Louis last weekend. She and more than 80 other individuals were arrested on Saturday after they, quote, refused to leave after being asked multiple times, according to a statement from the university. Stein said the demand from the encampment was specifically for the university to divest from Boeing, which manufactures munitions used in the ongoing genocide against the Palestinian people in Gaza at their nearby St. Charles facility. Stein was charged with assaulting a police officer. She has been outspoken about her opposition to the Israel-Hamas war, and she joins us now to tell us more about her experience on campus and also her presidential run. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jill Stein. Great to be with you both. Thanks so much for the honor. Our pleasure. Uh, why don't you start by telling us what you saw at Washington University in St. Louis? So um, we had given a held a campaign event uh, a few blocks away at the public library, and there were several students there who were very inspirational. And on our way out of the library, one of the students, not one of the presenters, but just another student uh, who was there, asked us to come. Uh, to the encampment just to show support for the students. And we said, yes, of course, because the students, you know, in my view, are kind of the most powerful engine of, um, of political change and social change and stopping genocide. So we were really glad to be invited, glad to be there. When we got there, the uh, organizers asked us if we would um, talk to some of the university administrators who were milling around and see if we could help de-escalate the situation. So myself and two of the aldermen for uh, St. Louis who were also there uh, went over and tried to speak with them. Um, didn't really make much difference. Uh, I mean, for a couple hours they backed off and then they, then the cops again, you know, sort of formed a lineup. And um, then they basically, came at us and I was assaulted with a bicycle, you know, a bicycle held up basically at, at I don't know how high, chest height, uh, where the handlebars were ramming into my ribs, the handlebar, you know, which was going crossways. Um, the bike was, you know, horizontal and the handlebars were being rammed into me and, and the pedals. And they were trying to push us over. And if you've seen the footage, uh, you'll see that we were basically being kind of tipped backwards uh, to like crash um, uh, on our heads to fall backwards. And as they were pushing us backwards, the cop directly in front of me reached down and pulled up my, uh, my right foot and jerked it up and like to deliver the knockout blow mm. and to knock me back onto my head. And I, um, uh, because we had locked arms, I didn't fall down and I was able to, um, you know, just as a reflex to kick up with my, with that leg to try to recover my balance. And when I did that, he said to me, you just assaulted a police officer. Mm. And, um, uh, and then we recovered, they backed off from the bicycle and I don't know exactly when we went down, but at some point we were all down on the ground. And then we were, you know, kind of manhandled and and uh, and cuffed on our stomachs. And then, you know, and then we were walked to the paddy wagon. Then we were all processed. And there were actually over a hundred of us who were arrested. Uh, we were processed. And at the end of that, you know, rather routine, uh, processing, basically getting paperwork. I was then separated from the group along with one other uh, older gentleman, a history professor from the University of Illinois. And there's footage of him being charged completely unprovoked. He was just taking pictures and he was taken down by a gang of burly police officers who charged him, uh, manhandled him, cuffed him, dragged him on his back, and then jumped on him with the full force of their knees on his stomach directly. I didn't observe that. I mean, I didn't know about this. This is just on the video footage, which is there. For right, the world right, Doctor. And I think you're referring to Steve Tamari, and that was very uh, gruesome footage in part because it seemed like he was not conscious when he was being dragged off. Um, that was has been reported out now for days. The footage that you described of yourself was also really extreme, the bicycle being used to kind of corral you all. And now knowing that you were charged, 
right, charged, literally, but also charged under the law with assault for trying to keep your balance. A presidential candidate, nonetheless, and then the other gentleman you described being a history professor, it does really... I think go counter to a lot of the narratives that at least were deployed when people were defending disproportionate police force being used in other protest movements with perhaps less notable or um, uh, kind of culturally, uh, po you know, positively received figures because of their, you know, young age or their race or other kinds of factors. Given that you have experienced some of this firsthand, I wondered if you could take a moment to opine on the raids that we saw at a number of universities across the country last night. Uh, Columbia specifically uh, featured a, a huge police response uh, to the protesters who had occupied Hamilton Hall on Columbia's campus. And we also saw a, an attack from pro-Israel uh, protesters happening as well in California. Can you weigh in on what you're seeing there and how you would respond to these differently than Joe Biden if you were president? Yeah, I mean, these assaults are, um, you know, a really horrible commentary on the state of policing, on the way that the expression of our right to protest, our right to free speech, and our right to express the majority opinion of the American people who find uh, this genocide absolutely horrific and unacceptable, the fact that that is under assault, you know, under actual physical assault uh, on our campuses is just shameful. Um, and, you know, the fact that our government, you know, is in full support of this support also agrees, uh, I should say, in full support of this assault and agrees with the effort to shut down any discussion of, uh, of the genocide and resistance to the genocide. Um, you know, it's a real commentary on, on, you know, the terrible disconnect between our government, you know, who exactly are they serving? You know, they're protecting the war contractors, they're protecting APAC, they're protecting the whole, you know, um, endless war machine. It's, it's just a real commentary on, on where the alliances are, that they are not with the people and, students who are really reflecting majority opinion here are being absolutely brutally crushed. Brown University is the counter example where uh, the administrators said, I think yesterday, that uh, they agreed that their board would have a vote on this subject. And that's all it took and the uh, encampment agreed to disband. And that was, you know, a really respectful way that not only respects the students, but respects the issue. This is a really important and critical issue. It should not be suppressed. It should not be, uh, you know, brutally silenced. Uh, it should be debated and discussed. And the university should be a participant in this and not simply a servant uh, of the war industry. And I must say, this is also a commentary on the state of our universities, that they are dependent on, you know, this corporate money, whether it's Boeing or other, you know, war contractors. Uh, this is, you know, this is terrible that our institutions of public higher education are essentially serving, you know, this, this, um, this war effort and are a part of the infrastructure behind this genocide that our tax dollars are supporting. And so the, the tuition dollars of the students are also supporting this. So, you know, it, it's reason for us to you know, continue to um, resist in every way possible. At UCLA, the pro-Palestinian protesters set up zones where they wouldn't let um, students that they said were Zionists enter their midst. It happened in the library. It happened in a public outdoor space. It's on video. Do you think those are justified tactics on, undertaken by the pro-Palestinian activists? Personally, I, you know, those are not taxes, ta tactics that I myself would employ. Um, you know, I think it's important to maintain uh, dialogue and access and not to needlessly, uh, you know, overpolarize the situation personally. But in the scheme of things, you know, those aren't tactics that I have seen myself used in any of the encampments I've been at. I think it's the exception, not the rule. Uh, overwhelmingly. And, you know, I think the real issue here is that uh, we are on a death watch for 2 million people right now. As a medical doctor, you know, I'm just extremely hyper aware that it is a miracle hour by hour that, you know, an, an epidemic of infectious diseases hasn't brought out, you know, 800 people 
to one toilet, no water, no food, no um, no sanitation, no shelter. They're under bombardment. There is a ground invasion that is about to launch at any moment. You know, so uh, I feel I I feel like this. The, the smaller issues, yeah, you can you can critique how this movement is happening, but there is an incredible moral imperative, I think, right now. Uh, I grew up, you know, after the Holocaust as a Jew in a Jewish community, attending a synagogue, a uh, reform synagogue, and we were really taught that, you know, this was this was like um, the immediate post-Holocaust generation where people were trying to come to terms with this existential. Uh, distress, really, that human beings can do this uh, to each other. And the Jewish community had just suffered a Holocaust. So we were taught that genocide must never happen again, and that it is unacceptable, you know, absolutely unacceptable uh, to either perpetrate genocide or to be a bystander to genocide. And, you know, I think that's really important that it is incumbent on all of us to do what the um, International Court of Justice uh, basically tells us to do, that this is a uh, presumptive genocide and uh, we must do everything in our power to stop it now. Let's turn briefly to your presidential campaign. Um, you know, this is a race a repeat between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, which, you know, large numbers of Americans on both sides of the political expectra, uh, spectrum have expressed dissatisfaction with for a variety of reasons. Um, RFK Jr. as a third party independent candidate is attracting a lot of media attention and some good poll numbers. Um, what do you make, uh, do you feel the media is giving you the attention um, you deserve given they, that there is a little bit of focus on a third party candidate, just happens to be RFK Jr.? Yeah, no, I think we've been pretty, um, you know, uh, intentionally uh, left out of the mix, I think, because we are not a one-off, you know, uh, we're not a, um, you know, a here today, gone tomorrow, you know, or a first time around the block. We really are a movement. We are a, a, a political party with uh, state chapters in most states. We are, you know, a threat uh, in a bigger way to to the you know to the uh, parties of war on Wall Street. We're here for the long haul. The uh, agendas of the progressive candidates here, that is, of Dr. West and um, Claudia De La Cruz and our campaign, our agendas are actually pretty much the same. The difference is that we already have 75% of the work done to be on the ballot across the country. We actually are a threat and therefore, you know, and we are on track to be on the ballot across the country. There will be three pro-genocide, pro-war candidates, and there will be one anti-war, anti-genocide, um, pro-worker campaign. And, you know, that's a actually a really interesting uh, opportunity. They could put, split the, th the pro-war vote three ways and in a four-way race, it can be one with 26% of the vote. So, you know, we, we are in a perfect storm for political change right now. And the numbers are sorting out in a way that could actually make some really, you know, unexpected black swan, um, you know, uh, developments uh, quite possible. So I think we are actually a greater threat than that the, that the mainstream media would prefer not to recognize. And I don't, ex well, put it this way, I hadn't expected them to give us really the time of day until we were on the ballot, uh, until we completed our ballot drives. But just with the events of the last couple of days, that seems to have exploded in a big way. So we are getting a whole lot of attention now that we didn't expect. Oh, and the other thing I should mention is that the most recent poll, which came out of Wisconsin, uh, showed us actually at uh, 8%. You know, so we do see eight eight percent overall, and twenty two percent age thirty and under, and something like eighteen percent uh, in the next age bracket up to forty five. So our numbers do seem to be coming up, and even without main attention from mainstream media, the word does seem to be getting out that you know that we are a distinctly different uh, campaign from the uh, from the two zombie candidates who are being rammed down our throats, and from RFK, who's you know. Uh, whose positions are not altogether well understood, especially his position about the war in the Middle East. You know, he describes himself as an anti-war candidate, but then you have to pretend that the war in the Middle East is not a war. It's a very big war that could potentially, you know, go ballistic on us. Um, 
So, you know, there are kind of three candidates over in another uh, category, and we could be the sole alternative. So it could be quite interesting how this settles out. Last point on this is that Bernie Sanders, uh, in his 2016 campaign, uh, to my recollection, he was percolating along at 2 to 3% for quite some time into the primary. So there is precedent for, you know, for a uh, uh, kind of sleeper campaign to emerge in a big way still. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I'm so glad you brought up that polling, which I did see really significant numbers in Wisconsin, a state where there has been, uh, through the uncommitted campaigns, a real uh, expression of a desire for an alternative to Joe Biden, specifically because of his handling of the war in Gaza. And polls of young vo voters suggest that is also motivating their, I think, 81 percent disapproval of Joe Biden, again, with respect to the handling of the war in Gaza. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Stein. I hope we talk to you again soon. Thanks. Great to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.